get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And I'm here with Tim Ash, who I'm going to introduce formally. But Tim, I always like to mention past episodes of the podcast people should check out. I was thinking what would be appropriate for today because Tim is uh, an amazing author, speaker, and many other things and founder. Um, so you could check out an episode I did with Michael Gerber of The E-Myth, um, David Allen of Getting Things Done. Um, and other interesting ones, I'm thinking popular ones that people like. People like the one um, that I did with Tony Horton of P90X and um, that story. I like talking about the, you know, and we're going to talk about stories, Tim, because you're really, you really hit on, hit home on, on stories specifically. But he talked about some of the low points. You know, we see Tony Horton as the, the founder and probably untouchable, but he talked about how he drove cross country, had no money, and he made food and rent money. Um, just putting his head on the street and doing street performing. So that's how he made his food and rent money at the time, you know, as a street mime. And I made him do street miming on the actual podcast. So you <laughs> can watch it and see him do it. Um, and before I introduce Tim, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25, which I co-founded with John Corcoran. And we help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships um, by helping you run your podcast. So it generates, uh, you know, it generates, makes sense to, give to your network. And the number one thing for me, Tim, is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my relationships. And I found no better way than to have the people I, and companies I admire to have on my podcast. And I was trying to convince Tim before we hit record to reinvigorate his podcast. And I think it's an amazing medium. And I think everyone should have a podcast. Um, and I've been saying that for over a decade. Um, and so if you've thought about podcasting, you have questions, you can go to rise25.com. Feel free to email us. And we're happy to answer anything that your heart desires. And um, so without further ado, Tim Ash is, he's an authority in evolutionary psychology and digital marketing. And he's a sought after international keynote speaker. He's a best-selling author for Unleash Your Primal Brain. Tim has been mentioned in Forbes, Entrepreneur Magazine, because of you know all of the marketing and the thought leadership that he's produced. And he has had worked with companies like Nestle, Google, American Express, Verizon, and so many more, laundry list of them. And you know, for even for 19 years, he was co-founder and CEO of Site Tuners, uh, which was a strategic digital optimization agency. And he just has a deep expertise in user-centered design, persuasion, understanding consumer behavior and all that. And he's, a, he's an OG of this stuff. He's been doing it since the mid 1990s and he's been an early pioneer. Uh, Tim, thanks for joining me. Yeah, my pleasure to be with you, Jeremy. I just want to know how that uh, mime on a podcast thing worked out. I'm, I'm glad this has a video component too, because that would be a boring episode. Exactly. The mime no. that went on the podcast. Yeah, you cannot, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Um, you know, speaking of video, we're we're on video. So if you're watching the video, you should watch the video because if you're looking behind Tim's shoulder, he's got the cool coolest background, which is all of the badges, not all of them, probably just some of them that he spoke at and keynoted at conferences, right, Tim? Yeah, it's a it's a bunch of wallpaper back there, probably a couple of hundred badges from the last 15 years of speaking across four continents. I, I kind of feel ripped off in 2020 because I don't get virtual event badges. I mean, I've done hundreds of those as well over the years, but I can't put the scalp on the wall, you know. Talk about, you know, I was asking before we hit record about some of your most prized events and you were mentioning the RD Summit. Yeah. Tell me, what? Tell me about that. Well, Brazil is amazing. This was in um, Florianopolis, Brazil, which uh, I live in San Diego. They call that the San Diego of Brazil. They have the beach culture, the skate, surf culture. Uh, and uh, Brazil is just really dynamic, lots of young people. And this was a huge um, online marketing event. Uh, and it was about 12,000 people. So it was the first time I had two, three foot or three story tall jumbotrons behind me. And I came out on the catwalk and all of this stuff. It was quite something. What did you talk about? 
I talked about neuromarketing, about how to impact people by understanding our evolution and our psychology. So that's uh, one of the things that is at the intersection of the digital marketing and the evolutionary psychology that I'm focused on now. Who's, uh, who attends that conference? What yeah. type of people? Online marketers from a wide array, array of industries, um, from, uh, say, people that are hands-on practitioners all the way to executives at, at companies in Brazil. You were mentioning, Tim, some of the other speakers that you enjoyed at that summit also. Yes, uh, Dr. Robert Cialdini was there, uh, who's a big professional crush of mine. And he was actually kind enough to blurb my latest book. He he got his hands on it and he said, I love it. And so and what does it is say? Saying, what does the blurb say? Invaluable insights into human decision making and behavior. That's a lot coming from he is if anyone hasn't checked out influence. It's, I mean, the Bible. Yeah, yeah, it's the, Bible. the Bible. Exactly. <laughs> I probably, you probably have also read it like more than three times. Absolutely. And he just came out with a new edition, incidentally, of Influence, completely updated. And a couple of years ago, published another great book called Presuasion. You know, we'll get into kind of your journey a bit because you have a really interesting journey, um, you know, that you were a computer scientist. You know, yes, right? I, I like to say I'm a recovering technologist. So I'm I'm looking forward to hearing this this whole journey. But first, start off with why did you write Unleash Your Primal Brain? Wow, that's a great question. I as you as you mentioned, I'm known for digital marketing, specifically what's known as conversion rate optimization, or how to make websites more efficient. And so I've written a couple of best selling books on that uh, called Landing Page Optimization. They've been translated into six languages and sold 50,000 plus copies, which is pretty good for a marketing textbook. And I ran a conference series here in the US as well as in Europe called Conversion Conference. It's now been renamed Digital Growth Unleashed. And that was the first industry-wide conference on conversion rate optimization. And also ran for 19 years, founded and ran an agency called Site Tuners, which not surprisingly with that name was focused on improving website efficiency. So we worked with the uh, Googles and Nestle's and Siemens of the world on down and created 1.2 billion in value for our clients that we can document. And the, the reason I wrote this new book, which is not about marketing, it's about evolutionary psychology, was really to what's the best way to put it, level the playing field for consumers and individuals. We're getting sliced and diced for our data. There's all kinds of AI and algorithms that are zeroing in on our slightest um, behavioral inclinations, and we don't even know what's going on. And, the, and so what I want to do is shine a light on how the human brain really works and retrace that arc of evolution so we can figure out where we picked up these bizarre abilities that we have. Yeah. I mean, even with the documentary social dilemma, it kind of talks a little bit about that, that it's just kind of, you know, we're just doing things and we're being served up different ads or marketing and we are uh, maybe a pawn. I don't know if you have an opinion on that. Yeah. Well, I, I like to say that we're, we're kind of dandelions blowing in the wind. We think we're just such rational creatures and we have free will. And in fact, if, if we're hungry or tired or different music's playing in the background of a, of a shopping mall, we're going to do different things reliably. Uh, and so I think that that notion of free will is something that I'm very much questioning. It, basically the brain is there just to help you survive. And it's doing that on a, moment to moment basis, given the local conditions. So essentially, if you set up the right conditions around someone, they're going to be much more likely to behave in predictable ways. Tim, with, I want to talk about your journey a little bit with site tuners. What made you first start site tuners? This is like when even if you look in the 90s, I don't even know what websites look like in the 90s. I mean, the, the internet, <laughs> what the internet was like then. Well, iframes were a big deal back then, but yeah, we already had the World Wide Web and browsers. Yeah, yeah started in the mid 90s and started essentially an incubator for new dot coms. We helped them raise their first rounds or acting CTO on the team and build database driven websites, which was being done in the raw back then. And um, it, it was a very interesting run, eventually moved into driving traffic 
pay-per-click traffic, running keyword campaigns for companies. And that led us to thinking that the problem wasn't the traffic, it was about the crappy websites and landing pages where that traffic was ending up. And that's when that whole discipline of conversion rate optimization uh, sort of took off. And that's what we focused on. Do so you remember one of your first big clients that you're like, wow, this, this client wants us to work on their, their digital assets? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, American Express flying to New York from San Diego uh, to meet with them. That was kind of a big deal back in 96. <laughs> so what did they want from you? Well, they wanted improvements in, uh, essentially what they had was a, a user experience problem. They had a lot of different divisions. Here's the retirement planning, here's the credit card people. And what they wanted was a unified view of that for the consumer in an online portal. So we were trying to solve the problem of um, essentially making it user-friendly and actually centered on the needs of the visitors. Yeah, and what were some of the other big lessons in the running the uh, the agency. And I know it's funny because we were talking before we hit record that the transition from agency to solopreneur, most people go solopreneur and then form this big agency like you had. So walk me through some of the big lessons in the agency. And then I want to talk about transitioning the other way to solopreneur. <laughs> well, I think it's, um, I always joke that the second hardest business model in the world is running any kind of professional services firm. The hardest one is doing live events, in-person events. That's when I started my conference series that, that took it up another level of difficulty, I guess you'd say. Um, the best way to, to answer this is really that you have to understand yourself. And here I am in middle age, I like to think I have a little better handle on that. But my highest and best use on the planet wasn't running a professional services firm. You mentioned Michael Gerber and the e-myth. I had my entrepreneurial moment of insanity thinking, yeah, I can do this better than my, my boss. I'm just going to start my own thing. So I took down 2,000 square feet, an internet connection, a desk, a computer, and I called my girlfriend at the time. I said, hey, I'm running around the office naked. You know why? Because I can. It's my company. Uh, so that's how it started. And uh, it was an exciting time, certainly, but I thought I was getting rid of bad bosses at big companies. In fact, I started hiring them. Uh, every new client is your boss, and it's sort of like getting married before going on a first date. So it's like, oh, wait, you're insane. I just didn't know what flavor of insane we we're talking about based on your corporate culture. So you have to manage employees, you have to manage client expectations, a lot of moving parts. Uh, so it wasn't what gave me juice, I guess you could say. Yeah. I mean, you did it for almost a couple of decades. <laughs> I'm more stubborn than most. So, yeah. I started in 95 and uh, sold the agency a couple of years ago. What was, what made you decide to finally uh, sell? Hmm. Well, it goes back to that self-knowledge. I sold it to business partners, by the way, who are much better suited to running the agency and they've tripled the size of it since I left two years ago. So that tells you something about alignment with your life purpose. But I guess I was looking at myself, my mom had died uh, a little before that. And I was thinking, what do I do with the remaining time on the planet? And so having a clearer sense of mission and purpose is something that, that moved me to do that. I went through a fantastic weekend initiation through this um, international organization called the Mankind Project. And as part of that, I recommitted to a new mission statement. Mine happens to be, I co-create a world of peace, safety, and love through joyous expression and service. And it, having that as a North Star metric, I could say that running a professional services firm didn't really line up with that. Where's keynote speaking, writing books, the new neuromarketing course I just launched on LinkedIn Learning, uh, having a mastermind group for marketing executives. Those are things that float my boat. So basically, I just did an inventory and jettisoned everything that didn't serve me and focused on the things that uh, got me up in the morning. Was that um, an easy or hard conversation when you discover that to go to your partners and say, this is not my calling right now. Well, I think it was actually clear to most of the employees at my agency that I was in some way not cut out for that role. And the, 
the partners that uh, that I sold my stake to are much better suited to running it. Uh, my close friend and uh, to this day, uh, former business partner, Marty Greif is the president of it and he's doing a fantastic job. So I think it was almost like a recognition after the fact yeah. of what everybody else around me already knew. Hmm. Got it. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that people, it's kind of clear to others as opposed to ourselves, we're the last to know sometimes. Yeah, that, I think that's always the case about insights. Uh, people often have a more objective, unbiased view of you from outside, but it, it, it takes a lot of pain to shift. It, the, I don't think anybody shifts just because they want to be a better person. It's a discomfort with who they are at the moment, and that has to build to a certain level before you actually act on it. So talk about the transition from agency to solopreneur, right? So at this time, had you done um, a lot of keynotes already? Oh, yeah. I, I yeah. Uh, like I said, run my own conference. I'd done at least 100 keynotes. Uh, uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't stuff. like a huge, huge change. Well, right. psychologically, it was because if I'm not a an agency CEO of the last 25 years, then what am I? So there's probably a three to six month period there where I felt a bit like a turtle without a shell. And then I realized that, yeah, all my friends are still my friends, my, my network of people who respect me, my ability and my knowledge um, hasn't gone away. I'm not doing that routine stuff anymore that used to bore the crap out of me or having to just do the client relationship management, uh, which I didn't enjoy. So uh, we used to joke in the agency that a little bit of Tim goes a long way. So now I get to parachute in and do those high engagement, high value things, and then ride off into the sunset and say, you guys implement it. What else did you find interesting about the transition from agency to solopreneur? Uh, I, I think it's what you have two choices of um, what you can do in terms of being more effective. You can try to double down on your strengths or you can shore up your weaknesses. And I've come to the conclusion that you should double down on your strengths, that everything you're not good at, you should outsource or stop doing. And so as a, uh, an entrepreneur and a founder of an agency, I had to wear many hats. And a lot of those didn't fit me. And so I, it's, it's really freeing to take the parking brake off and, and it, not to do the things that you're not well suited for. So again, I think it takes a certain amount of insight, but I've done a bunch of personality tests, as I'm sure you, you have, like Myers-Briggs and DISC and uh, Enneagram and the Ocean Model. I've done them all. They basically say the same thing from different perspectives. And so it's a, just a question of how early in life do we start listening to the voice of who we really are and what environments that works well in. In Unleash Your Primal Brain, um, you talk a lot about, you know, the power of stories. So mm. I'm wondering some of the compelling or favorite stories that, that you found or that, you know, readers find in the book. Well, yeah, storytelling is a, is a uniquely, distinctly human thing. And uh, a lot of people misunderstand why they're there. We actually evolved the ability to tell stories. And... Um, they're very powerful for the fundamental reason that we need to make a sense of the world. And our world is largely social. So there's a couple of things there. One is causality. How do we predict? If I do this, then this predictably follows afterwards. So we tell stories to understand that causality. And then the other thing is, as I said, we, have, we live in an intensely personal world. Most of our thinking, in fact, our default thinking unless we're doing math problems or something like that, goes to social reasoning and modeling our place in the tribe. And so we also tell stories in order to, as a form of social currency and as a form of reinforcing relationships and transmitting cultural values. That's really the big evolutionary bet that we placed was to transmit culture. And stories bypass all the logical defenses and they go directly into somebody's head. So, this, so they're incredibly powerful. You know, when talking about marketing, you were saying something about you don't want to just have marketing that is pleasurable, but then invokes some amount of pain. What did you mean by that? Mm. 
Yeah, that, that, that's a great, great question. There's, we evolved to detect threats. The reason you're here is because your great, 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 great grandmother didn't get eaten by the bear. Exactly. And the reason is because she was alert enough to know there was a bear around or there were threats around. So we're actually much more sensitized to fear, loss, and pain avoidance than we are to upside. So think of it this way, your brain's kind of lazy. It doesn't want to do anything. Most of the time it's just on autopilot and doesn't change a thing or want to consciously think about change. But if it is going to change, you have two ways to affect it emotionally. One is with upside, hey, you win the lottery or have some ice cream uh, or downside, which is pain. So, hey, Jeremy, what's your favorite type of ice cream? Uh, ben and Jerry, so I'm lactose intolerant, but um, so I <laughs> buy question. Ben and Jerry's non-dairy chocolate chip cookie dough. Right on. Okay, so here's a bowl of that, except as you reach for it, what about if I hit you on the back of the hand with a hammer? Just the one time, what do you say? I'm probably not reaching for the ice cream again. <laughs> okay, you have to be a real ice cream fan to, to, to go for that value prop. <laughs> yeah, and so that's, that's, that's my point, is we know we can reliably focus people with pain or loss. And there's a famous adage, the bird in the hands were two in the bush. It's, it's pretty much a two to one ratio of losing something versus trying to regain it. Um, so marketers often are fighting with one hand tied behind their back by saying, we're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Well, congratulations. But unless uh, you, you rub salt into the wound and tell me the full implications of me staying on my path, before telling me about your product or service, it doesn't create a lot of compelling value. There's the workout motto, no pain, no gain. And that pretty much applies to marketing. Unless you can create a pain in me, there won't be any financial gain in it for you. So the mistake people make? Being too nice, not saying anything negative. And you don't have to you know, crap all over your competitors, but if say you're selling tooth whitening, you wouldn't say you'll have white teeth and a, and a wonderful smile. No, what you do is you say, wow, the, those yellow teeth keep you from ever opening your mouth. You have resting bastard face. You're going to die alone with cats because you'll never get a date. That's how you sell tooth whitening. I've never heard of the resting face. <laughs> well, there's resting bitch face and yeah, resting right. bastard Got face. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so highlight the pain points really for whatever market you're in as opposed to trying to sell that, that vitamin or pleasure. Yeah, the happy, happy talk. That's what I call it. Happy, happy talk is not nearly as effective. You can use them both, but you have to start with the pain. So what you want to do is take me on this emotional roller coaster down into the bowels of hell and then back up into the light. And you haven't even talked about your product or its cost or anything like that. You want to create that contrast, which makes my brain want to do something about my current situation. Tim, is there an example you could think of? You don't have to name the company, but that, you know, basically heard you or read your book and, and maybe you don't know this because they didn't share it with you, but anyone you've talked to said, hey, like we're doing exactly what you say not to do, Tim. We are leading with this pleasure and we've changed our messaging and now here's what the messaging looks like um, so we can see uh, an example, or maybe it's just an example you observed that it's bad. And well, I, I don't know how specific examples, but I'd say two thirds, maybe three quarters of that 1.2 billion in value that we created was used, was created by applying these neuromarketing principles. And loss aversion is an obvious one. The one that worked really reliably, there are a lot of companies that have three plans, right? And usually you have the bronze, silver, and gold, and people put them in that order. And what we always tell people to do, it's just like money in the bank, is reverse those. Anchor on the gold plan, then go down to the silver and go down to the bronze. And at each step you say, you know, for the silver, you get the stuff in the gold, except we're going to take away the following features. And you see the psychology of that? Of Now you're talking about loss. And a loss of resource makes my brain less able to survive and deal with the environment. So I hate losing stuff. So just reversing the order of stuff on a plan page and, and focusing on what you take away from each version to the next, it can be incredibly powerful. Yeah. It's kind of like taking your 
over 20 years experience in conversion rate optimization and taking it right, kind of right to the human psychology piece, it seems like. Well, I would say differently. I would say I've come full circle. When I was at UC San Diego, my PhD work was in neural networks, artificial intelligence, AI. I never finished, unlike you, so I don't get to call myself Dr. Tim. <laughs> seven years in, I quit and started at my first company. And I, I applied it to marketing, but now I've come to full circle to what's the brain about? How do we persuade people? How does this all work? And uh, I find that a lot more engaging. And it's so to say that you know, marketing is fundamentally based on evolutionary psychology. If you're focusing on the technology, you're totally missing the point. I don't care if it's TikTok or virtual reality or I don't know, hologram suppositories tomorrow. The thing you're trying to influence is still the human brain. So if you don't understand how that evolved, you're not going to have a durable career as a marketer. So you talked about, Tim, the psychology of those plants, right? I love that. So start from the, the most, you know, the biggest gold plan and then take yep. stuff away. What are some other examples of how you've seen psychology work within a, a page that that someone's interacting with. Well, well, that plan actually, that plan page description I gave you actually had two principles. One was loss aversion. So to talk about taking things away, right? But the other was the starting with the expensive one first, which is another idea of anchoring on something. People don't have a notion of absolute value. They don't know whether your enterprise plan versus your agency plan. What, what's the value of that? There's no absolute value. So you always anchor on the expensive stuff. So for example, when Apple launched its first iWatch, they launched the gold edition for $10,000. Now, not too many people bought those 10,000 worldwide. So you'd think that would be a big dud for them, but they weren't trying to get people to buy it. Some were stupid enough to, but they were trying to make the price of the 399 regular iWatch seem reasonable because they were setting this big anchor 10,000, well, compared to that, 399 is cheap. What they weren't telling you is that, yeah, arguably that first generation iWatch wasn't that different than your $10 Casio. <laughs> but they didn't want you to make that comparison. 10 to 399 is a big step up and a lot more financial pain. So anchoring is also a very important principle. In the lobby of your experience, put your most expensive, outrageous thing. You may not even want me to buy it. It's just there to anchor. The loss aversion price anchoring, what's another gem that you, well, you think well, about? Well, well, anchoring. Another one is that um, people actually uh, love certainty. They will pay a premium for certainty. So um, anything that's certain, black or white, is evaluated by the automatic primal parts of our brain. Anytime we have to kind of think about the trade-offs of something or the nuance of it, that requires conscious thought. And that's a very scarce and uh, quickly depleted commodity. So for example, um, how you frame things, we, we talked about loss, but also certainly, let, let's say you're going in for a medical procedure and I'm, I'm your doctor and I say, well, Jeremy, uh, great news, you know, like you, this is an in and out, it's impatient, you'll be out of here in an hour and 95% chance everything's going to go smoothly, right? Now, if I say to you the same thing, which is, yeah, there's a 5% chance that you'll have complications or die on the table during the operation. How do you like them apples? No, we'd pay a lot to remove that premium of uncertainty or any chance of death. So when in terms of how we evaluate risk, black and white, all or nothing, it's either you go to that um, resort in Cancun, it's all inclusive, drinks, tips, everything. We got you covered. There's no uncertainty about how much you're going to pay. And what that does is it makes you willing, be willing to pay a lot more to mm. remove the uncertainty. I love that. You know, Timmy, find like the, the people who are driven, uh, entrepreneurs, founders, they're running away from something, some kind of pain, <laughs> right? And um, what, what, do you, what have you found drives you? That, that's a great question. When I was in graduate school, and you can probably relate to this, I came up with this thing, which is that, boy, you really have to be psychologically driven to want to put yourself through the hell of grad school. And look at me, I'm the only exception. I'm perfectly normal and balanced. Turned out that wasn't the case. I think in my case, it was uh, being an immigrant from the former Soviet Union 
and having to uh, establish myself there. My mom also had some mental health issues. And so that definitely was a formative thing for me. She, has, she has, uh, had borderline personality disorder. So I had to make some psychological adjustments. And one of the reasons I ended up in California was to be 3,000 miles away from New Jersey, where my parents lived near Philly. Um, so yeah, the, I, I agree. Strong forces often shape us. When did remember, you come to the U.S.? Uh, I was eight years old, and then my family emigrated back in the early 70s. And I remember once there was this show about uh, predicting entrepreneurial success, and they had five factors that were actually clearly correlated. Male, firstborn, uh, immigrant, Jewish, and no advanced degree. So I kind of blew it on that last one because I was so stubborn. I wanted to get the advanced degree just like my parents had, but I hit the other four. So, Wow. I didn't know that. When you came to the States, um, did you speak English at the time? or Not a word. I, I, in fact, for kids younger than you know, 12 or 13 before puberty, I'm really not f a big fan of bilingual education because kids will soak that up like a sponge. My parents plunked us in a public school. I was eight, my brother was five in kindergarten. I know for a fact we were fluent three months later. Kids are really adaptable. Wow. So the, so the mistake my parents is, made was actually yeah. insisting that we speak English at home. They should have insisted that we only speak Russian at home because we were immersed in the English anyway. Yeah, that, that is tough. I mean, I know, you know, my, one of my daughters is nine and I can't imagine plunking her into a school where she does not speak the language. It, it, it's a bit of an adjustment, but it happens so quickly over the course of a human life that she won't even remember it. Yeah. I, I mean, do you think, how was that um, when you were there um, as far as the, the people like treating you that you didn't speak the language. Well, I, again, I don't even remember that time remember passing. I should have been in third grade. They put, we arrived in the U S in February. So I finished out the year in second and the next fall, they advanced me to fourth and fifth grade. I won the, the fifth grade spelling bee. So, I mean, I, I caught up. It's no big wow. deal. It's amazing. Um, I, you know, first of all, this is fascinating, Tam. I, you know, your journey from computer scientists, a digital agency to, you know, unleash the your primal brain and what you're doing now i want to encourage i have one last question i want to encourage everyone to go to your website um i know you have multiple websites but one is tim ash t-i-m-a-s-h.com to check out what you're working on what your book um and then i think you have a specific um you know primalbrain.com that people can check out for the book and i believe you can buy it on amazon i know and yeah. I think you could also get it on Audible as well. That's right. So the timash.com is about my public speaking and digital marketing advisory services, website reviews, or executive support on digital marketing. Uh, primalbrain.com is all about the book. And as you mentioned, you can get the ebook, audiobook narrated by me and paperback worldwide. And you can also, if you go there, just look at the table of contents and pick out the sample chapter of your choice. And I'll send it to you as a PDF. So uh, try before you buy it. I'll give you a money back guarantee if anyone gets the book and hates it. No one's going to hate it. Come on. <laughs> um, but uh, so are there any other places before I ask the last question, any other places we should point people online to find out more? Uh, no, I, I encourage everyone to connect with me on, on LinkedIn. I'm pretty easy to find there and um, spend a lot of time on LinkedIn for professional stuff. But uh, all the contact information is on both of the websites and uh, just reach out timash.com, primalbrain.com. Awesome, Tim. Last question. And I'm going to call this the, the Chris Snyder final showdown question because Chris <laughs> Snyder is the one who introduced us. So thank you, Chris. Um, he has a Snyder showdown podcast. He also um, own and run, runs banks.com. Uh, mm -hmm. believe it or not. So check out what Chris is doing. Um, last question. I always like to ask this with someone like you who has uh, a couple books, has a lot and sold a lot of books, who does a lot of speaking or what are your favorite books? And obviously you mentioned Influenced by Robert Cialdini um, outside of Unleash Your Primal Brain and your landing page book. What other books do you find um, that you go to? 
Uh, well, uh, Yuval Harari's book, uh, Sapiens, was, was mind-blowing. Uh, that was probably intellectually the most powerful book I've read in several years. Uh, and he goes a lot more into culture. I'm focusing more on the operating system, if you will, what we all share in common. He talks about how culture evolved as well and what was transmitted culturally. But that's a brilliant book. As far as self-help, I would say uh, Walker's Why We Sleep. I have a whole chapter in my book devoted to sleep. Uh, really? It's so oh. foundational. And there's so many people cheat themselves by scrolling through their phone or binge watching one more episode on Netflix. Big mistake. Seven to nine hours of sleep, non-negotiable in my world. I love it. Yeah, actually, that's that was I'm pretty healthy overall, Tim, but my worst um habit is was not sleeping as much I, I got an aura ring and actually just tracking it has definitely helped me just because it's you're seeing the data you know yeah and most people say hey, diet exercise and then sleep comes in a distant third that's completely backwards you can't function as a human being read social situations learn physical skills um manage your your reactivity anything like that. I mean, sleep is daily life support. Uh, so it's a really big mistake to cheat yourself. Just another person reinforcing that. So I appreciate that, Tim. First of all, <laughs> I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out primalbrain.com. Check out timash.com. Check out the book, Unleash Your Primal Brain. If you're watching this, Tim, talk because uh, I'm going to let you talk for just a second because uh, it will only show me talking even though you show the book. So uh, I'll let you talk and hold up the book so people can see it. This sounds good. Yeah, it's called Unleash Your Primal Brain, Demystifying How We Think and Why We Act. Check it out. Everyone, thank you. Check out more episodes. Thanks, Tim. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 